Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of General Conference Conversations, a podcast where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and I'm super excited to be here with you all today talking about the words of Christ's chosen leaders. Let's get into it. So today, we are talking about the very last talk in the Saturday evening session, The Lord Jesus Christ Teaches Us to Minister by Elder Yusida. Yusida? probably going to butcher that every time I say it. I'm so sorry. Um, As I said, this is the last talk in the Saturday evening session, which means that it is the last talk of the Saturday sessions, which also means that I'm going to be taking a small break. (laughs) Um, My mid-season hiatus, I guess you could say. Um, I... Let's see, it'll be a couple weeks, I think it's two and a half, I'll be back at the end of July with the last two sessions, Um, but just so I have a little bit of time to catch up and get ahead, Um, and it's summer and all that stuff. So, I will see you guys in a couple weeks after this episode, but for now, we are talking about this talk um, about ministering and as always I encourage you to listen to and or read this talk before you come listen to me talk about it so you can get your own inspirations and promptings and everything like that Um, and then hopefully I can add something to your study but I'm gonna jump right in really quick here Uh, like I said this is all about ministering and as the title suggests all about ministering. And he starts out by talking about all of the places and all of the ways that, that Christ is referred to as a shepherd. The good shepherd, beautiful shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd, um, in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, all of that, and even in our modern day um, in general conferences and things like that, often he's referred to as the good shepherd. And he talks about President Nelson recently talking about how um, one of the marks of the Lord's true church is an organized, directed effort to minister to children of God and their families. Um, and, and then he talks about the parables of, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. And so these were in response to the Pharisees complaining and criticizing Christ for eating with sinners, with, you know, tax brokers and people like that, right? And I really loved this. He talks about these parables. He says, oh my goodness, hold on. So sorry. He says, it's interesting to note that when Luke, the gospel writer, is introducing the three stories, he uses the word parable in the singular, not in the plural. It appears the Lord is teaching one unique lesson with three stories, stories that present different numbers, a hundred sheep, ten coins, and two sons. The key number in each of these stories, however, is the number one. And a lesson we might take from that number is that you might be an under-shepherd for a hundred elders and prospective elders in your elders' quorum, or an advisor to ten young women, or a teacher to two primary children, but you always, always minister to them, care for them, and love them one by one, individually. And if you remember from the last episode, we talked about... um, Elder Natchez's talk, um, and his, one of the last, the last quote that I read, talked about Christ ministering to the people in the Americas, and how he ministered to them one by one. And, I don't know, I thought that was cool, and this was around the time that these, these three parables where um, we were, we were studying them in Come Follow Me around the time that this talk was given. And 
they're very beautiful they're such beautiful parables they're such an amazing reminder to us that I mean for a lot of different things right <laughs> it reminds us that as the under shepherds as he's I use that word a couple times and I love it as the under shepherd to the Lord that we should be going out and finding the lost sheep the lost coin the lost son and that as we when we are the one sheep that strays or the one coin that gets lost or the, par the, the prodigal son that leaves right that as we are those lost one that christ will continually come and find us he'll never leave us alone and i think that's it, like looking at it both ways those are such beautiful things and so he talks about ministering and like the importance and the the great task that we have as ministers to the people in our ward to the people around us um to search until we find and 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 love those who come back no matter what so you know, he tells a story he and his wife were serving in central america and he met um this woman named julia and was talking about with her about her family and she told a story of her father that he was um an amazing minister and a, a true under shepherd of the lord his he visited and ministered and served he rejoiced he went through um anyway and then her mother passed away he remarried a few years after he remarried they got divorced and he felt very out of place and a bit criticized for his divorce. And he stopped attending, attending church uh, because of this kind of criticism that he felt that the people had for him. And he talks about this urgency. Oh, there you see it. talks about this urgency to to bring him back into the fold. And so he got his phone number and he he called him. He kept calling him over and over and over. And he finally answered the phone one day and he said, hey, I met your daughter and I was absolutely captivated by the way she spoke about your service and the things that you did for the children of God while you were part of the church. I'd love to meet you. And he was like, well, why? And he said, I really want to meet the father of such a wonderful lady. And so they met. And he, Elder Yusuda asked him to share some of his experiences of ministering and serving. And um, he said, I, he noticed that the tone of his voice changed. He felt he, like you could see it. He could see it in his countenance, the way he was excited talking about these stories. And um, he eventually he got to a point where he knew it was the moment for him to you know, ask him to come back, to invite him to come back. And he said, I don't, I didn't know what to say. And so I prayed and asked. And he finally, he said, as a servant of the Lord, I apologize for not being there for you. And we would love for you to come back. We need you. You're important. And he did. He came back and he had a very nice conversation with his bishop. And a few months later, he passed away. But this, this, this talk is very short. This is literally the end of his talk right here. Um, he says this. I testify that with our Savior's help, he can love, we can love his precious sheep and minister to them as he would. I think that's such a powerful promise. Ministering is hard. Ministering is not easy. <laughs> um, 
And I'm not just talking about like the, the assigned ministry we have at church. That's also hard. I'm really bad at ministry. In that like organized sense. But it can be hard, right? It can seem like a lot to, I guess just the, the word minister sounds so like massive, like we're going and, you know, he called this man over and over and invited him back to church and he came, right? And I think the way we talk about ministering, the way we talk about ministering, missionary work also can feel very overwhelming, can feel very massive and um, kind of like impossible to do sometimes. It can feel very, like it's way too much for us. And... But he says very specifically that with the Savior's help, we can love his precious sheep and minister to them as he would. And we think about the ways that Christ ministered to people. What did he do? He taught them. He loved them. He hugged them. He cried with them. He ate dinner with them, right? He spent time with them. He, if you think about his disciples specifically, he had nicknames for his disciples. He knew them and he, he loved them. He spent time with them. We can do that, right? That doesn't take too much effort. It, it, sometimes it feels like it does because life is just crazy. But finding that time to invite somebody to dinner or... I think sometimes also we think about invitations as being you have to invite somebody to award a function or a church or an activity or something like that, but inviting them into your home where you have the spirit or that you say prayer before dinner, inviting them to a uh, family home evening or something like that, right? Um, so that's my question for you. My one question, this is going to be such a short episode because it's a very straightforward, kind of short talk. How can you minister one by one to those around you? I'm going to give a, kind of, tell a story. I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. So, as a missionary, um... There are a few leadership assignments in the mission. There's assistants to the president, there is zone leaders, district leaders, and sister training leaders. And then of course, like you're a trainer is also an assignment, but as like a leadership over many other missionaries. So the APs, the assistants to the president, are kind of over everybody. Um, the zone leaders are kind of like stake presidents. They cover our zone, makes. Uh, is made up of several districts and then each district has a district leader they're kind of like a bishop at least that's how I think about them in like the structure of the church um and then sister training leaders are over just sisters and it just depends on who you're assigned to sometimes they're all sisters in your zone sometimes they're the sisters in your zone and another zone it just depends on kind of geographically and where they assign you and who you, who you get assigned to but either way, <laughs> when I first got into our mission, we had a lot of missionaries, um, had a lot of big feelings <laughs> about the young leadership, the missionary leadership in our mission. They had had less than pleasant interactions with sister training leaders specifically. A lot of the sisters felt like they we're kind of talking about them behind their back, that they just didn't care about them. Um, and I, I'm sure this wasn't true. I'm sure the sister training leaders were doing the best they could, right? They're, they're, it's hard to be a leader. It's hard to be a leader among your peers, especially. Um, I was a sister training leader later on in my mission for the last couple of transfers. And so I know how hard it can be to be a sister training leader. But um, it was just rough. 
and and I remember feeling some of this I didn't have any sister training leaders that I hated like there wasn't any that I was like oh I don't oh, I don't ever want to serve with them I just didn't feel like I could go to them for things right like I didn't feel connected to them I didn't feel like they were somebody that I could you know if something was going wrong with my going on with my companion I didn't feel like I could call them I would call or I would like you know on Mondays and stuff, I would talk to former companions, like, I was, I was closer to them, which, I mean, makes sense, but I just didn't feel like they loved me, I knew they loved me, but, like, on, like, a deeper level, right, of, like, I can't complain to you, kind of a thing, it, it's, it was a different feeling, and so when I got called as an STL, I was given the most amazing companion, I adore her, I'm gonna start crying. Um, I got to see her for the first time in two years, a couple of weeks ago, and it was perfect. Um, but she and I worked so well. We were together for two transfers, my last two transfers in the mission, and she was absolutely fantastic. We worked together, like, just as missionaries really well. We were a really good team. She jumped right into things. It was a new area. And so of course I had to like introduce her to people, but she jumped right into conversations and right into lessons. I didn't feel like I was doing more work. Like we were a fantastic team. And then as STLs, we had like the same goal. We wanted our sisters to know, the sisters that we were assigned to, we wanted them to know that we loved them. And they could call us for anything. And, and I was like, if, if, if they know that I've succeeded as an STL. And so our first transfer, I think it was, we actually had a district leader call us and say, hey, this you're over these sisters, right? And we said yes. Um, and it wasn't our district leaders. It was somebody else's, it was the sister's district leader. They were in our district. They were in our zone. Uh, they were in our zone, but they were in a different district. Anyway, he said, they've had a really rough couple of days. Do you think you could stop by? So we were like, yeah, absolutely. We made them cookies and we stopped by. And it was the very beginning of the transfer. So like it was the first time we were really interacting with them as STLs. And we just talked to them on their doorstep for like half an hour, 45 minutes. And they filled us in. It was still COVID. So like we had to stay on the doorstep. We couldn't like go closer which is really unfortunate but um we just talked to them for a while and it was amazing it was fantastic it was beautiful and we got a call from their district leader a few days later or that night or like maybe the next day and he said i want you to know how much they talked about you on our district leader call because at the time the district leaders were calling every companionship in their district every night to talk about their day and see how they were doing and he was like they gushed about you and how amazing it was that you guys stopped by and how grateful they were that you stopped by and we were like okay cool we're doing something right and then our second transfer we had a couple of different sisters that we were assigned to there was a couple of sisters um, called us. This is pretty close to when I was going home. Like it was a few weeks till I was going home. And the sisters called us, a set of sisters called us and they said, so we were in contact with somebody who had COVID. And so of course we have to get tested and we are in quarantine until our test results come back. And they were like, we're pretty sure we don't have it, but we can't leave the house and this was like a Sunday night and so they were like we're gonna be quarantined over P day and so we won't be able to go shopping would you guys be able to do our shopping for us and it was like they were like nervous to ask us and like my companion and I were like absolutely yes please like <laughs> we will absolutely go shopping for you and so we stopped by and we got their like cards for them they gave us lists and we did their shopping for them and dropped all their food back off and went home and my companion and i talked about that all day we were like both of us we were just like we're doing something right like we have succeeded as stls 
they knew that they could call us and that we would go shopping for them. Like that's so kind of random, right? But like they knew that they could talk to us. They knew that they could ask us that and and they did and they came to us and asked us um and I just felt like I had made it <laughs> like that was my goal as, as an STL to know that my for my sisters to know that, that I loved them and that they could come to me for anything um and I think isn't that what ministering is I am a terrible minister like assigned ministering awful at it I have never gotten into the habit of it nothing but I try with the people in my life with people for them to know that they can come to me that I love them and they can come to me when they're having a hard day they can call me or they can text me or whatever and know that I'll be there for them and I have had amazing people in my life who have made that known, either in words or actions, know that I could come to them if I needed them. And that is, it's incomparable. Like, it's, it's so important. It's amazing. I can't even, I don't even have the words for it. And that's what Christ does for us, right? He stays. He says, come to me weak desolate i will give you rest and we can do that for other people we can be his hands on the earth so how can you minister one by one to those around you and not just people you're assigned to minister to but your friends and neighbors and family and co-workers and whoever you interact with on a daily basis um it's truly amazing. <laughs> being the minister and also being ministered to. So that's my question. That's kind of all I got for the, the talk part of it. Like I said, it's a very kind of straightforward talk. But as for a further study, um, let's see. He, there's a, an Ensign article no, the Ensign article called Shepherds, Lambs, and Home Teachers by President Nelson in August of 1994. And then um, Ministering with the Power and Authority of God, was April tw uh, 2018, um, talk by President Nelson. I, that's, the, that's the conference where they introduced ministering as a new program. Um, but I can't remember exactly if that's the talk that he, like, introduced that with. Anyway. But, and then, of course, he has a bunch of footnotes to um, the parables he talks about and things like that. So, always look at the footnotes for any um, scripture study. But, that is all I've got for you today. But thank you so much for listening and or watching this episode of Dental Conference Conversations. As I said, I will be back in a couple of weeks, be the end of July, with the Sunday morning session. <laughs> so we can finish those last sessions up before our next conference. Um, as always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you can follow me on your podcatcher of choice or subscribe on YouTube. I also love to hear reviews and comments and emails and messages um and have conversations with you guys and all of that is in the show notes and um i'll talk to y'all next time <laughs>